When we think of the works of the theologian John Calvin, the Swiss reformer, we think of his commentaries, we think of the institutes and, the, and all of those heavy volumes of theology that came from his pen. But I think one of the most wonderful things that Calvin ever produced was a volume of sermons taken from the book of Job. It's magnificent, and those of you who struggle with understanding this important book of wisdom in the Old Testament, I think would be delighted to uh, feast on the insights that are provided by Calvin in that book. The book of Job is a book that touches all of us because it speaks to the question, why is there suffering in this world? This is perhaps the most profound question that we have to face as Christians. Why is it that we live in a universe that is governed and ruled and has been created by a being who is absolutely perfect, and yet this world is filled with imperfections and with pain and travail? Where is God in all of this is the central motif of the book of Job. The setting for Job takes place in the patriarchal period in antiquity. That is, if we were to understand Job as a real historical character, we would assume that he lived sometime around the time of Abraham or Isaac or Jacob in those days of antiquity. Many scholars believe that the book of Job is never, never was intended to be a historical account of a real person because there's so much of a poetic nature in the book, and some see it as an extended parable or uh, fable or something of that sort. But tradition uh, falls on the side of believing that the book of Job is trying to communicate the story of a real historical person who had a real encounter with God. But again, one of the reasons why people think it's fiction is that part of the literary form of Job follows that of a drama, of a play, with scenes and acts and so on. There are extended soliloquies and, and dialogues and so on. And the story, <clears throat> in the very first chapter, after it gives us a brief introduction to the lead character, Job, opens up more or less within heaven itself. And since here we get a glimpse into the inner chambers of the residence of God, that has also led people to think that it was never intended to be a historical biography. But let's look at it in its beginning. In chapter 1 of the book of Job, we read this, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him, and his possessions were seven thousand sheep, three thousand camels, five hundred yoke of oxen, five hundred female donkeys, and a very large household, so that this man was the greatest of all of the people of the East. What you're describing here in this book, in the, in the uh, vivid portrayal of the lead character, is a man of enormous wealth. Uh, he's depicted as the most prosperous man of his age. Abraham was one of the wealthiest men of his day, but the description here would seem to indicate that even Abraham's wealth was dwarfed by the prosperity that was the possession of this man, Job. We read, And his sons would go and feast in their houses, each on his appointed day, and would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And so it was, when the days of feasting had run their course, that Job would send and sanctify them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed gods in their hearts. And so Job did this regularly. You see, he's described not only as the most wealthy man of the period, 
but also as the most godly man of the period. And that may be jarring to us because we are told by Jesus in the New Testament how hard it is for those who possess riches to enter the kingdom of God. Even though we have examples in the scriptures of people who are fabulously wealthy, who do not allow their wealth to corrupt their devotion to God, it still makes it all the more startling that the book describes a man who, despite his overwhelming wealth, remains godly and devout and just before God. Well, the stage is set for the conflict of the drama. Verse 6 of chapter 1. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? And so Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face." And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. And so in this scene of the drama that takes place in heaven, Satan comes into the presence of God after walking to and fro upon the earth, looking at his domain. He's the prince of the power of the air. And God said, what have you been doing? He said, I've been looking all over the earth. It's as if Satan has this diabolical glee to report, you know. He says, it's as if he's saying to God, I've been looking over my domain and everything's in my pocket. They're all following me. And God said, have you considered my servant Job? And the cynicism of Satan drips from his lips when he says, yeah, Job. Sure, I've considered your servant Job. You've given him every blessing a man could receive, and you've built a hedge around him. You've protected him from disease and from plundering uh, marauders. You've given him a uh, family that's wonderful. You've given him possessions and power and prestige, all these things. <laughs> Does Job serve God for naught? He knows a good thing. And what's Satan saying? He says, the only reason Job is devoted to you is because for what he gets out of it. And he says, let me at him. Take away that hedge, and this supposedly upright man will curse you to your face. Now remember that what goes on in a play or in the theater has to do with conflict. That's what drama is about, resolving conflict. And here, the conflict is set at the beginning. There's a contest here between the powers of heaven and the powers of hell. And it may seem on the surface that poor Job is a pawn in this contest between God and Satan. So the book unfolds, and we see that Satan launches an attack and first, Job loses his property. Verse 13 of chapter 1, There was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in, in their oldest brother's house. And a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them, and when the Sabaeans raided them and took them away. Indeed, they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And then we are told that Later on, that the Chaldeans come and steal the livestock. So first his servants are slaughtered, and then his livestock is plundered by his enemies. Now, one of the most important things that this part of the story reveals 
is the relationship of God to human evil and to wickedness. Uh, this is very important to our understanding of the providence of God. Some of you will recall that when we looked at the lives of the patriarchs and we thought of Joseph, for example, who was shut up in prison and treated unjustly by his brothers, and yet when there was that reunion at the, the end of the book and the brothers were fearful that Joseph would wreak vengeance upon them, Joseph looked at them and said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And so the point is that even in the evil actions and evil choices and evil decisions of human beings, such as in the case of Joseph's brother, their decisions, there was a kind of concurrence. We're running side by side were the actions and the volitions of more than one party. God's will was being worked out in the life of Joseph, and God's will for Joseph was altogether righteous. And yet at the same time, the will of Joseph's brothers was to destroy Joseph. So their intent was wicked. So we have two different players here, God and the brothers, and they're both involved in the same action, but out of completely different motives. Now we ask the question, who's responsible for the death of Job's servants, and the loss of his property. Is it the Sabaeans, the Chaldeans, the devil, or God? And I can only answer that question by saying, yes. <laughs> that all of these are players in the drama. And you can hear the Sabaeans or the Chaldeans coming before the judgment seat of God, and God said, Yes, you stole Job's cattle. Yes, you killed his, his uh, servants. What do you have to say for yourself? And what's their excuse going to be? The devil made us do it. And then when Satan is brought before the tribunal of God, Satan can tremble and say, I was only carrying out the will of God. Because after all, he has more authority and more power than I do. And so we see in here, again, this concept of concurrence. It's not as though the, that Satan coerced the Chaldeans to steal the cattle of Job. They were cattle rustlers from the beginning. They coveted that, that property of Job all their lives, but they couldn't get at him because God had put the hedge around them. The minute the hedge was removed, Satan incites them. They are agreeable to this, and so they aid and abet the prince of darkness with their whole hearts, so that the actions of the Chaldeans, the actions of the Sabaeans, and the actions of Satan are altogether wicked. Now, what about God? Again, we see theodicy. The book of Job, in part, is a theodicy, an attempt to justify God for the presence of evil. But God's purposes are being brought to pass through the pain and the suffering of Job. And in fact, if there's any simple answer to the basic theme of this book and the answer to the question, why do we suffer? The answer is for the glory of God. Now, remember that this question is raised again in the New Testament in the ninth chapter of the Gospel of John, when there is a man who was born blind that is brought to Jesus, and the disciples come with a profound theological question to Jesus. The question is, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his sin or the sin of his parents? Now. Jesus answers that tersely and says, neither, but that the Son of God might be made manifest or glorified in these circumstances. But notice that the question that is raised by the disciples assumes 
that somebody must have sinned for this man to have been born blind. Because the assumption that they made was that suffering and pain in this world always is caused by sin. And Jesus on this occasion has to explain to them that they've made a false assumption here. They've committed the fallacy of the false dilemma or the either or fallacy. Either it's the sin of the parent or the sin of the child. Jesus says, no, it's neither one of those things. But we may then come to the conclusion, oh, well then there's no relationship between suffering and sin. No, the Bible makes it very plain that if there were no sin in the world, there would be no suffering. That pain and death and suffering are all part of the consequences of a fallen world over which God remains sovereign. But the error that the disciples made was in assuming that there is always a one-to-one -one correspondence between a person's suffering and their guilt. And we better not make that assumption. There are lots of reasons why people suffer. In the New Testament, sometimes people suffer for righteousness sake. Not out of their own guilt, but out of the consequences of their fidelity to God, they suffer. Sometimes they are brought into suffering by the hand of God for their own sanctification as pain becomes the crucible for holiness. However, sometimes God brings suffering into people's lives, even into believers' lives, as a divine chastening, as a reproving and correction, because He loves us. So we can't assume that the suffering I encounter is exactly related to my sin, but neither can I assume that it has nothing to do with my sin. So when I'm suffering, I look up and say, why is it, God, if this is because of something I've done, let me repent of that. But this is what happens with Job. The suffering mounts. He loses everything. His body is now ravaged with boils, and he sits on top of the dung heap, and he's scraping his skin with these potsherds, and, and he's in abject misery. And so Job's friends come to him to give counsel and advice. And basically, in this drama, the counsel and advice of the friends is this, Job, you are suffering more than we've ever seen anybody else suffer. That can only mean one thing. You're the world's greatest sinner. So what you need to do is confess your sins and repent before God. And Job is there broken and battered and bleeding. He says, I don't know what to confess. I don't know what I've done to deserve this. And they say, ah, see, you're so proud, you're so arrogant, you're so self-righteous, there has to be something that you're hiding here. Because how else can we explain, explain these calamities? And so Job's friends are very small comfort. Then Elihu comes and he just, just preaches platitudes to Job, many of which are true. But he gives them in an insensitive, pharisaical manner. And now even Job's wife comes to Job. I said, Job, I can't stand to see you suffer like this. Curse God and die. I love you, Job, but I'd rather see you dead than having to hang in here suffering all these things. So let's get it over with. Curse God. Remember the drama. Take away the head, Satan said, and I will get him to curse you to his face. To your face. God said, go ahead. And his own wife now. Isn't this the way it is? That when you're trying to do the right thing, the people that love you the most and that you love the most 
are the very ones that will try to talk you out of it because they don't want to see you have to face the consequences. Who tried to talk Jesus out of going to the cross? But his closest friends. Curse God and die. Job refuses to do it. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. But it doesn't stop him from asking why, and he raises his fist to heaven and demands an answer from God. And the dialogue that takes place between Job and, and God at the end of the book, which isn't much of a dialogue, it's more monologue or soliloquy, where God does most of the talking. Chapter 38, the Lord answers Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens counsel? by words without knowledge. Prepare yourself like a man. Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you and you will answer me. Here's Job says, why, 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 why? And God turns around and said, who is this who darkens my counsel with ignorance? Job, you don't know what you're talking about. And then he goes on and browbeats him, as it were, Job. Where were you? when I laid the foundations of the earth. Speak up. Where were you when I set the course of the stars, the flow of the rivers? And Job's listening to this interrogation, and finally, he can't stand it. And we read chapter 40. God says, so the one who contends with the Almighty, correct him. He who rebukes God, let him answer it. And here's Job's answer. Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. I lay my hand over my mouth. Once I have spoken, I will not answer twice, but I will proceed no further. Okay, God, I get it. I'm a sinner. I'm vile. I'll take my hand and put it on my mouth. I'm shut up. And God says, that's better. That's more like it. Now, I'll be tender. No. God said, okay, shut up. I'm not through with you. And the interrogation continues. Prepare yourself. Answer my questions. Would you annul my judgment? Would you condemn me that you might be justified? That's the question every Christian has to face in the house of mourning in order to justify yourself, are you prepared to condemn God? Then he says, "Where were, can you draw out the Leviathan on a five-pound test line? I can. Can you unbuckle the belt of Orion? I can. Can you set the Pleiades in their courses? I can. And then finally, Job speaks in chapter 42, I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes." He doesn't repent for sins that caused his calamities in the first place. He repents of his mistrust in the midst of his pain. You know, God never answers the question, why? The only answer He gives to Job, really, is the manifestation of Himself. Job, did you forget who I was? If you know who I am, then you ought to trust me. Job said, yes. And the final scene is the scene of restoration. God triumphs over the taunts and mockeries of Satan, and He restores the possessions in the house of Job far greater than what it was originally. This is the message of the New Testament. It's the message of Christ, that unless you're willing to be buried with me and to suffer with me in my passion, you will never participate in my exaltation. But those who join me in my death will participate 
in my resurrection. This brings us to the end of this section of our study from dust to glory. We've covered now our survey and overview of the Old Testament. We didn't look at every book. We skipped over the Song of Solomon and a couple of other small part portions of the minor prophets. But I'm th reminded of Luther's practice in his lifetime where he made it a, a matter of commitment to read through the entire Bible every year. And he said, I do that because it's like the forest and the trees. He said, for me, my greatest joy is to pick up a particular book of the Bible and exegete it carefully and minutely, looking at every chapter, every paragraph, every sentence, and every word. It's like examining the fine points of a single leaf of a beautiful tree. He said, but sometimes you can become so focused on the detail of that single leaf that you miss how the leaf fits in, not only in the tree, but in the forest. And so I want to keep the winds of the whole substance of Scripture blowing through my mind as it helps me understand each and every detail. So my challenge to you after this overview of the Old Testament is to pick up and read. Read it all. Digest it. Learn the sweetness of the Word of God.